Welcome to Building Better Businesses, an ABA podcast. Learn firsthand from business owners who built successful ABA businesses. Utilize proven techniques and strategies to help your practice thrive. This is Building Better Businesses in ABA podcast with Jonathan Mueller. My name is Jonathan Mueller. I'm the host of Building Better Businesses in ABA podcast, and I am joined by a special guest today, Kelly Birmingham. Uh, Kelly's been practicing in the ABA field for more than 25 years. She's a senior vice president of behavioral health at People's Care. She founded Social Skills Solutions, Learning Collaborative, and she's a published author who specializes in early intervention and social skills. She's also the co-founder and co-host of the podcast, A 25-Year Look Across the Spectrum. Kelly, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me. Hi, Jonathan. Uh, so, Kelly, I know you have a stepdaughter uh, with autism, and you've been part of her life for 15 years. Tell me more about your stepdaughter. Sure. So uh, my stepdaughter's 32 years old and um, she is excitingly living on her own. <laughs> she does live in an apartment down the street from our home and it is subsidized by some um, government funds. We were able to get her on a Section 8 housing list years and years ago. And that was a wait list for four or five years. And then one day she suddenly popped up on the list and they said, we're ready. And uh, what we decided was that she had a housing voucher and they wanted to move her into a community that was not our community. And so we thought about it and we thought, gosh, we had moved her out into an apartment. She was living on her own. We scaffold her support along with the regional center. And we found actually an apartment complex that's owned by a family who had autism in their family. And they agreed to become a Section 8 housing apartment unit. So she could move into this apartment that is on a second floor, uh, which was important to us because it's locked. She is a young woman. It was important for us to have find a secure place. It is located in our downtown hometown where she grew up and she worked at the local grocery store for years. So everyone in the whole community knows who she is. Um, and then she switched to work at the local Rubio's, but they were willing to become a Section 8 housing uh, vendor for us so she could live close by. And my husband, actually, I can't take the credit for that. He negotiated so much of that and worked the system. Um, but she is successfully living on her own with support and scaffolding and um, very proud. She's very proud to talk about her own apartment and where she lives. That's awesome. What makes her happiest? She, she is, it's so funny, you know, we were with her yesterday, we, you know, we see her five, four or five days a week, um, cause we scaffold, we help make sure she has, you know, healthy food to eat and exercises and her apartment is clean. And she's, she manages her own work schedule, gets herself to and from places, keeps track of her day-to-day, -day, um, activities. And she has a couple different passions. One, she loves guinea pigs. <laughs> she has six of them. They are covered in an outdoor patio. We had to find the perfect location for them. And she, her guinea pigs live 50% longer than anyone else's guinea pigs. She can tell you by looking at a guinea pig, their gender. She can tell you all kinds of guinea pig facts. She runs a guinea pig Instagram page. She has a TikTok page for her guinea pigs. And she's wildly known in the guinea pig community. And she'll tell me regularly how famous she is. She's like, I am TikTok famous. I have 11,000 followers on my page. And so that makes her really happy. And she also is um, very family oriented, particularly her sister. She's very, very close with her sister. Uh, her sister's two years younger than her mm -hmm. and they have a very close relationship. And um, we are um, in her grandparents, she's very family oriented. So we made sure we built a very strong family unit and community for her. Well, I mean, so strong for any kiddo or yeah. young adult. And I mean, it just sounds like she's really lucky to have you and you're super fortunate to have her. And I'm just, I'm curious, Kelly, because I know you've been a BCBA for so long and in our field for so long, but like, how has she helped or change the way you think about high quality ABA treatment? That's such a great question because a couple of things and my poor husband, I always end up throwing him under the bus when I have these conversations because <laughs> he raised her essentially on his own for most part. I've been in her world life since she was a teenager and we've, we've take, tackled that together. You know, 
a couple of things that even though I'd been a clinician for so long, a few things that I didn't really fully understand. And I'm not saying you have to be a parent to be a quality clinician, but you do have to understand the plight of families. And I didn't, there's three things. One, I didn't really understand the level of fatigue parents are raising children on the spectrum, right? And as a, as a BCBA, I'd say like, you know, don't give in, you know, stay strong, follow the plan. And that is so hard to do for our, for families, right? There are times now where my husband and I will have a conversation and we'll say, this is one we're going to give on, give in on, right? We're too tired. We're just not mm. able to follow through, but we have the conversation and it's a calculated, we're giving in for this reason, right? So it's not, it's methodically done. Um, but there are times when we allow ourselves to say, we're just not following through with this one. We're, we, there's too much on our plate and that that's okay. Another one, I didn't realize the amount for, I can only speak for my family, but guilt and anger and frustration. Sometimes my, my husband had raising a child. Um, there's so many challenges. Sometimes he felt like, gosh, if I'd only done this differently or done it that differently. And he is someone who surprised me when I started to learn about the level of guilt. And now parenting Melanie, there are days when I feel guilty and think, oh, I didn't do enough. I didn't do enough today. What, what could I have done better? And trying to help families take away some of that because it's all consuming. You know, you think about your children all the time. You, you're, it's a consuming lifestyle to think about the quality of life of your child on the autism mm. spectrum. It's all consuming. And then the third one was, is that sometimes, sometimes there are things as parents, we just have to do, right? It's easy to source out to an ABA provider. Um, and there are sometimes when Melanie responded better to other people than her parents. And so we had to make those decisions and say like, okay, this is one we're outsourcing because she's not going to hear it properly from us in the way we want her to. And then other times where we say, no, this is a parenting issue, not the outsource provider. And so we're going to have to tackle this one as parents. Uh, I mean, it's, it's your point, like it's, it's hard enough being a parent and, yeah. um, and I think one thing that I've seen in our field, and we've talked a lot in the past about sort of building therapeutic relationships with families, but um, you don't have to be a parent to your point. Right. But it just helps if you can see their plight, as you describe, right? As if, if you walk in their shoes and understand that there's so much more to life that goes on than just the program book and the the, the overlap yep. and then the sessions yep. that you're doing every day. And that's powerful. Exactly. And I, I think it's, it, it's, you know, when you and I initially had a conversation, one of the things I really appreciated was how like you focused on quality of life for your clients. And, and I'm curious, Kelly, like when was that moment that you realized quality of life was so important? You know, I, I want to say, I want to say in the last three or four years during the pandemic, like a little prior to the pandemic, mm. but particularly during the pandemic, I've been really looking at the quality of life for our families, right? Um, I think that, yeah. you know, um, and, and quality of life shifts, I've noticed, as as the kids age and become adults. And so it's a little bit of a moving target. And I don't think I fully realized that until mm -hmm. Melanie hit 32, her birthday's in May. And I thought, and and just yesterday, we were spent the day with her and I thought, God, she's grown up in the last month. Like each, every year when I look back, I mm. see the gain she's still making in her communication style and her independence. And so it gets me thinking about that quality of life target in what a family is thinking is a quality of life for their preschooler or newly diagnosed child is going to, you know, it's going to change as these kids get older, but there are a few denominators that don't change from my perspective. And one mm. is, depending on the child's age, the very first thing you want to do is make sure they're healthy, right? That health part is such a moving target for our kids with all the comorbid issues. I know the health health is a, still a target for my stepdaughter, Melanie, and her, her dad and I. She continues to have digestion problems. She continues to have sleep challenges and picky eating. Um, and so we're constantly, and no one knows the answer to that. We've been specialist after specialist and families have this plight, you know, it's not isolated to us. You know, I've probably seen 3000 different, um, children and adolescents, adults at this point in my career. And that health part is so complicated for our kids. And a lot of times challenging behaviors and self-injury 
happen as a result of health problems. I know a young man was 22 mm. who increased his aggressive um, aggressive behavior towards his mom. And it turns out he had ulcers in his esophagus, right? And that he got sick. We would have never figured that out had he not gotten sick and we had to go get some tests. And then we realized, oh, that mm. correlated exactly with the ulcers um, becoming inflamed. And so health is one that never goes away. And then safety. Safety never goes away either, depending on the age of the child. Um, forgive me if I'm being a little long-winded, but my stepdaughter the other day, something happened. And it's one of those moments where as a parent, you're like, oh, but she was waiting at the bus to take the bus to go to work. And we've taught her to use public transportation and she's proud of it. She only uses it during the daytime, never in the evening. And we have a, a safe little town and decent public bus. But a, um, a male drove up to the bus station, saw her there. You can sometimes tell after you've talked to her for a few minutes that there may be some developmental delays in the way she communicates. And he said to her, the bus mm -hmm. is running late. I can give you a ride wherever you're going. And she said, I'm going to work. And he said, oh, you're going to be late for work. Hop in my car and I'll give you a ride. And he was a stranger. And she said, no, I'm OK. Thank you. And she's telling me the story. And I, my, her husband, my husband and I are ready to throw up. Right. We're like, what happened next? And she said, then he said, well, I have alcohol. If you want to get in the car, I can give you alcohol. And she, thankfully, she said, I don't drink alcohol. It's bad for you. and It's bad for your body. And she's scripting our words at this point. And then he said, oh, well, I can get you a snack and get you there faster so you don't get in trouble. And she said, my dad and Kelly tell me not to get in the car with strangers. And he said, give him a call and hop on in and give him a call and you can call him on the way. And so he tried every trick to get her in that car. And she finally said, I'm not allowed to get in the car with strangers. And they told me if I'm in danger, call 911. And she called 911. And she took a picture of his license plate. And I'm like, oh, it worked. Oh, my God, it worked. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. like, 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 you never can prepare enough for those scenarios. And we were just like, we're crying and we're hugging her. And we're like, you did all the right things. And She's like, and her words were, well, you guys bug me enough about it. So at least I finally listened to you, <laughs> right? <laughs> <It's always laughs> so wherever we go someplace new, we're doing things. We're priming her for the safety part. And she's like, well, stop bugging me. But we're ne we told her we're never going to stop bugging her. <laughs> and it worked. And so it's like health and safety and then happiness, right? Everyone wants their kids to be happy. Mm. And the third one, and I'm sorry, I'm being long winded, but my, my, you know, for a while there, my husband used to say, Melanie doesn't have any friends. And I really worry about her happiness. But from Melanie's perspective, the whole community is her friend and she gets up every day. Mm. And she, she goes and gets her hot chocolate at this one spot and says hi to the lady in Starbucks. And then she goes down this morning walk and stops and sees the local jewelry lady. And then the nursery, the man who works at the nursery. And so she has all these people that say hi to her. She says hi, says hi to them. And she had their, her friends and it's her routine. And then her online friends, you know, most parents, you want your child, your adult to go out with people. She's very happy with the amount of friends she has online. And if you ask her if she's happy, she'll say, yeah, stop bugging me. I'm happy. Leave me alone. <laughs> so to me, those yeah, quality of life, is, those three indicators are super important. Healthy, safe, happy. Yep. Uh, and then there's an aspect of a community, whatever form that takes. How yeah, do we ABA always say, and you have a community Sorry, we always say you have a community tribe. Do you have your community tribe to go to? Tribe. Yes, absolutely. But like, what do ABA providers need to do to get this right, this quality of life framework? You know, um, I we're, I sit, I'm on a cast member like you. Um, I co-lead. Um, it used to be called the Parent Training Special Interest Group. I co-lead it with Heather O'Shea, who I know you know well. Um, we, we made an act, active decision to change the title to caregiver collaboration because it's often not just the mm. parents in the homes, it's grandparents, it's, you know, other family members. And we are actively saying we don't want to train parents, we want to collaborate. So one thing we're trying to do is make this shift in thinking. Insurance companies told us to save mm. parent training. Um, we all are saying, let's change this shift. And in collaboration, you know, there are quality of life measures. There are some tools out there that can for sure be used. CASP mm -hmm. is pulling together and looking at the best tools to assess quality of life. Um, 
I'm a huge fan of Mandy Ralston. You know her well, who also has spent, we've been talking a lot these last few years about quality of life, but at a bare minimum, I think ABA providers can ask those questions and say, and so I can tell you that I did create a set of questions for BCBAs to ask as part of their clinical interview that really are based out of, you know, like, is your child healthy? Let's talk about their health and ways we can talk about strategies or things to put in health. Is your child safe? Let's talk about what that means to you. Is your child happy? Are you happy as a parent? Do you feel in control of your household, right? Do you feel competent and capable in the way you're raising your child? And then the, a really important thing that we ask is we say, in six months, and then in one year, and then in two years, where do you see your child? And what do you mm. think we need to do to help get your child to that point? And that sort of forward-thinking view for parents. That forward-thinking view is like is so critical because it's hard to paint a vision of like what what might my child be, and especially say if it's a it's a recent diagnosis, and so parents like ideas have changed around like what their child may right. or may not be able to do. But you know, Kelly, my my big thing in life is words have power, right? Yeah. And so this idea that like insurance companies bless their hearts, like have used this term parent training, which means now we have used this like yep. adopted this term parent uh -huh. training. Think about training almost implies a deficit, right? That's right. And I don't care what parent you are or how good or bad or whatever a parent, but like generally parents are trying their best. And so approaching it, not from this deficit mindset, but from right. a caregiver collaboration, we're going to collaborate just feels like a more partnership oriented approach. Absolutely. And I think for me, there was an article that came out in 2018 with Linda LeBlanc, Bridget, Dr. Linda Blank, Dr. Bridget Taylor, and others that talked about the compassionate caregiver model, right? And they listed sort of the things that folks thought BCBAs were doing well and things that BCBAs weren't doing well, which was active listening, asking these type of questions. But what I'm finding is BC, this is not part of the BCBA training coursework. Like family dynamics, family systems, understanding autism is not really in mm. the coursework. And so even for my own agency, I have about 13 um, aspiring BCBAs in a mentor program. At our organization, we put when they're getting their supervision hours, we also set them up in a mentor program. And they, um, regardless of the of the program they're in, they're in some very well-known programs, understanding autism and the challenges and the strengths and joys of raising a child on the spectrum and what that might look like from a family, a whole family perspective is nowhere in their training, in their programs. So I know for myself, we have, I have some parents I can go to and we set up parent panels. So my team can ask the questions and ask parents. We also did, um, Mm -hmm. I have I have a de deep enough network that I have a number of children who I worked with when they were three are now in their 20s. Mm -hmm. And I had four of them come to a Zoom meeting and talk to my team members about what it was like growing up and having ABA in their house and what that felt like. And for the parents to talk about it, what that feels like. And I have a young man who's fairly nonverbal, but can type the answers um, and text his mom mm -hmm. and his mom speak for him. And so he did that. And so I just don't think we have enough in our training about the caregiver's perspective and what the caregivers and the child with autism are looking for in their life. Yeah. What is it going to take as we think about like course, the course sequences, as we think about the task list, like what's it going to take to incorporate what feels like critically important parts of building that compassionate relationship? with families? What's it going to take for a field to get there? I know. It's a great question. I, I Sometimes I, I feel like it's such a small fish in a huge pond, um, but that is the goal of the CAS Caregiver Collaboration SIG. We have, we've tackled all these questions and a few others. We are trying to put together sort of a tool, if you will, that BCBAs can use when they're in, when, when BCBAs mm -hmm. are doing an initial assessment with a family, and or our progress report that all, those are all required and part of what we're used to doing for our payers, right? And so as part of that, mm -hmm. um, 
adding more questions, um, you know, sort of giving some depth to the conversation that it's not just, I, oh, I have to interview and see how you're doing with your progress, check off a box, but like really providing the types mm. of questions and being okay, taking the answers from that question and putting it in the treatment plan. And so as BCBAs, we're sort of all been sort of conditioned that we have to do the treatment plan the way the insurance payer has told us to. And so some companies have adapted mm. one treatment plan for all those insurance providers, but it, it, they, and some companies do whatever, whatever plan each insurance company asks, but it doesn't mean you can't add to that plan. And so I know what I spent the last few years doing is adding those questions to my plan. I'll literally type out the question mm. and say like, you know, do you feel confident? How capable do you feel managing your child's, you know, challenging behaviors? Or do you feel like your child's happy? And what are some things you'd like to, you know, some things we could do to help ensure your child's happy or ask the child, like, are you happy? What are some things I can help you with that might make your life better? And I actually put the questions in the plan and then write goals from the mm. question. So the, it's like an addition to the treatment plan. And I have yet to have an insurance company deny it as long as I have the other things they want in their plan. And so I think just sort of, I think the more we can empower ABA providers to say, hey, insurance payer, you know, we're going to make some adjustments to treatment plan to include quality of life because they're not. The, plan, the, the templates are giving us are not there's nothing in those plans that, that ask about quality of life. We have to step and tell the step up and tell the payers we're going to also add this in. Wow. So that's interesting. So like having this like really important sort of bolt on resource is absolutely a, like an important measure in the meantime. I'm just curious though, like as our field evolves, is this the kind of thing that ultimately gets baked into core sequences and like supervision task lists and other things or as your sense that it's going to be up to providers accessing resources and uh, efforts like the caregiver collaboration CASP SIG in order to that's make that a, happen? That's a great question. You know, that's probably a question for people more involved, known in the field than I am. But I personally think what I what I've heard when I talk to some of the school contracts, like we have internships and practicums with different they, what I've heard from those folks is they say they think that's happening in the supervisory experience portion of the BCBA work. And mm. what I'm finding is the folks providing that supervisory work don't have that understanding, knowledge, or scope within their, their practice. So they're not providing it. Uh, and I mean, just a supervisory experience is going to have a bell curve of like that's probability right. distribution outcomes. There are going to be some great Supervisors <laughs> supervising um, and some not so great. But let me pivot a little from, from caregiver collaboration to, to social skills, because this is another really important part of your of your work. But you actually wrote a book on social skills. Um, and I, like I just I, I've observed that there's this like severe lack of just social skills groups available in our field. And, uh, you know, what why is that? So, you know, that's so interesting. Me too. So 20 years ago in June, I wrote the book with a colleague of mine. So it was in 2000. And there were the mm -hmm. ABA was a pretty young field. It was very much relegated to a lot of discrete trial work, a lot of low boss work. And there were sort of two books out there we all used because we were we knew the strategies, but we were left to come up with curriculum. Like I used to say, I know how to teach, but who's going to tell me what to teach? And, you know, in 2000, mm -hmm. there were there wasn't a lot out there. There was Catherine Maurice and Gina Green had a book, um, Let Me Hear Your Voice, which was my Bible. And I carried it around. And it was a great starting tool for sure. But as I started working with kids, and it's particularly as they got older, the, the type of sophisticated social skill needs weren't in any of these tools. And so I know that we mm. spent a year actually going to the developmental psychology work and looking and saying, well, what are the milestones mm. that kids should be reaching? And at what age? Because back then we were just, you know, we were just pulling things and saying like, oh, when someone says hi, you should tell them your name. Well, that holds true for a certain time in your life, but not every time in your life. And as you age and grow and, you know, I was finding the four-year-old boy who would say, hi, my name is Noah. I'm four years old. What's your name? And he was saying that to every single person he met 
every single time. And it, so it's sort of been, you know, um, overtaught and overgeneralized. And so we started looking at the developmental psychology and saying like, well, what should, what age should these skills be happening? And, um, we looked at that and then just sort of made a checklist and say, okay, by six, you should be doing these things. And by eight, you should be doing these things. And, mm -hmm. um, Put, and then we we also took a look and said, well, can you do these in a one-on-one -on -one setting, but can you also do them in a group setting or in a natural setting? And so early in my career, in 2003 into 2015, I did have a private practice here in California, and it was solely group mm -hmm. ABA-based. And so what I hmm. found was kids were coming from one-on-one -on -one companies, having had 30 hours a week of one-on-one -on -one in their home, but didn't know how to demonstrate those skills outside of that setting. And so I started looking at and saying like, well, how do we know if a child's ready for group learning or not? Like, how do you know? How do you know when they're going to be ready? And so um, mm. I've recently in the last five years created my own sort of group readiness learning tool. It's just simple 10 questions um, to determine. I completely borrowed it from the work again, Dr. Bridget Taylor did years and years ago in um, a chapter and let me hear your voice and kind of expanded on it and just started looking at like how quickly can we move so it's two things it's how quickly can we teach you to look to learn from in a one-on-one -on -one setting to a group setting because group is school right if you like the mm -hmm. way learning happens particularly academically is in a group setting. And then on top of that, so can you learn in a group setting? And then secondarily, do you have the social skills to navigate those group mm -hmm. settings with your peers? And there are, there are other tools out there. I am an early start Denver model certif ther certified therapist. Um, they have, they've created a tool that I was like, gosh, I looked at and thought, oh, my tool that I created matched. Good. I was on the right track. Um, and their tool goes up to age six. And what it does is it looks at, and it's similar to ours, and then we took ours and expanded it. It looks at the diagnostic criteria and the social skill development that should happen. So, for example, kids mm. by two years old have a certain level of joint attention. They now are learning to watch their environment and change their behavior based on what they observe. And historically in ABA world, we teach imitation skills, but we teach them in these sort of discrete, mm. isolated, imitative responses and not the, you didn't hear the teacher's direction. So look around, see what others are doing and copy so you know what to do type of imitation. ABA practice owners, are billing and insurance issues getting you down? Well, let me tell you, Element RCM is your answer. Element provides world-class revenue cycle management services, contracting, credentialing, authorizations, billing, and more. Element's your partner, so you can focus on what you love to do, providing the highest quality services to your families and clients. Element's a preferred partner of the Behavioral Health Center of Excellence, and its founders have nearly 20 years of experience owning and operating successful ABA organizations. They understand you. They know that every dollar counts, that integrity is everything. Element works with any practice management system. And Element's not a vendor, they're your partner. So find out more and take a free revenue cycle assessment at elementrcm.ai. Yeah, it's, you know, what I, I wish there were more Kelly Birmingham LLC, like group social skills <laughs> providers out there that, you know, any at Ascend or, or anywhere we can, we can refer our kiddos. And yet that doesn't happen. I, and I've heard all kinds of feedback around. It's just hard logistically, right. To concerns about HIPAA and, yep. and privacy and, and other things, but like, why are there not more of those organizations or do they exist and people don't know, but you know, I don't know. What's your thought? I think that there are, so I think there's more because there's definitely been a shift. There was a shift in our field a few years ago from in-home to more center-based work. Like organizations are now creating center-based scenarios. I had a center in 2003 and people thought it was wacky. Um, and it was hard. It was hard for sure. Yeah. Um, and so the, the field has shifted more to center-based but it still doesn't understand the what to teach. They understand the how to teach, but they don't understand the what to teach. Mm from my perspective. And again, because 
in our training programs to become BCBAs, they're learning the task list, right? They're not learning the yep. family collaborative experience. And they're also not learning like what neurotypical development looks like in how is that different specifically from autism and what areas. So basically we need to, and Rebecca Womack po posted something like this on LinkedIn recently. Mm -hmm. Basically, we need to get back to looking at the diagnostic criteria. And if you dive deep into that diagnostic criteria, it's there, right? Um, you look at the, the diagnostic criteria, the, the symptoms that are presenting um, in observable behavior and what autism looks like, match mm -hmm. it neuro, to developmental neurotypical be what should be happening. And there's a whole host of goals right there, a whole host of treatment plan, treatment skill acquisitions that, that can be um being taught. I have developed. Yeah, this is a great. Go ahead. Yeah, please go ahead. I, I was going to say, I have just in this last month created an online platform, a social skill learning collaborative. It's a subscription service where people can join for like $10, $20 a month, meet with me, talk with me, share ideas. I'm going to start doing a little more publishing um, on the types of things that people could be looking for. I know that if you go onto Anna, Amazon, you can find our social skill checklist on Amazon. You can find it on uh, the downloadable version, but I also provide a lot of that information on this new social skill collaborative that I've set up through Patreon. Because well, it's I'll, an evolving. I need to make sure that those are like. Mm hmm. Hundred percent. And I mean, you're you're right. Like, eighty percent of the battle is like you've got a center, you've got a place to do it, and you've got other kids around. That's the right environment. Now let's make sure the what to teach is is clear. So I'll definitely make sure that those are linked to the show notes. But I want to come back to, I mean, you are like, you're an OG entrepreneur in in the ABA fields. I mean, 2003 to 2015 and, and you know, the ABA company that, that you founded. What did you learn from that experience? Yeah, that, what a great question. So, you know, the a couple other folks were as OG as me that I know of personally. One is Amanda Ralston, Manny Ralston. Another one, Sarah Troutman. She, I was in California. She started in Northern California in 2004. I, mine, I opened in 2003, but it really got going in 2004. Now, insurance law did not cover ABA back then. Right. Insurance law in California only came into existence in, in California in 2013. So at that point, it was tricky for me because in California, all of the ABA was funded either privately or through regional centers. Now, mm -hmm. my particular yeah. regional center where I lived would not vendor a center based program. They didn't understand it. They mm -hmm. didn't believe it. So it was all cash pay. And back then. And so um, what I ended up doing was people paid privately. And then I also did a lot of sliding scale fees. And so I was certainly not getting rich, but I was doing great work, <laughs> I felt like. And one of the things that I think that people don't understand is the groupings of the kids is one of the most integral parts of the social skill groups. What the model I always had that I still to this day feel pretty strongly about is we would take a couple of children that could learn in a small group model. So maybe I had like three children that could learn with one adult, right? So I, now I have a three to one ratio. Mm. I would as often and as much as I could have either a sibling or a neurotypical peer into the group. And those were actually easier to find than I realized. And then I would have a child who couldn't learn in a one-on-one -on -one setting and they would kind of push into the group with another adult. So I'd have four children. Mm. Um, actually I'd have five children, one a neurotypical peer, three who could learn in a group model who could also learn from the peer. And then I had a child who mm -hmm. needed one-on-one -on -one instruction, but deserved to be at the table with the kids learning. And so that was a model that I just always use. I think the thing to think about is we sort of, so insurance changed a lot of that. Um, and it's actually for the better. By the time I was winding down my practices, when the insurance law came in, out into fruition, and then it took sort of a year for it to really take off because there were caps in the beginning and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. So I was winding down in part because um, I was moving to something else, actually. Um, but what I, you know, there are lots of people who can, or sort of, what do they call them themselves? Like um, entre entrepreneurs, 
you us united. I can't remember. There's a whole group of people that basically say like we owned our own. And there's a reason ABA companies wanted to sell, right? They were, it's exhausting yeah. work. It's tiring. They wanted to get out and the money promised was good. And now, you know, we're, what we're seeing is, you know, personally, you know, family engagement is down for ABA right now. Um, companies, mm -hmm. I can't speak for every company. I can tell you what I've seen in myself and the other groups that I speak to is, you know, COVID was hard on all of us. We've had high turnover. Parents are tired of the revolving door of people coming in and out of their home. Um, they couldn't get to the centers because of mm -hmm. COVID restrictions. And so my personal think is family engagement right now is at a pretty low number in our field. And so the, what the centers can do to help with that is I think parents like to drop their kids off and take a break. And, and I think that that's yeah. valuable. But I also think that getting back in the homes and helping families needs to happen. So what I've learned is there needs to be a hybrid. There needs to be a hybrid of like centers, mm -hmm. group opportunities for the kids, and then also still in-home engagement. And we probably have to, and I have not figured this out yet, but it's my goal this week or two, how to get family engagement back and to trusting our field and wanting to have ABA therapy. How do we do that? <laughs> you know... I yeah, I myself, like all the other bit companies, right? We all had high cancellations in June. We, you know, families all canceled. Mm -hmm. You know, companies are closing. They're not, you know, they're not meeting. You know, they're not hitting their revenue numbers. Uh, you know, my company included. We had some good months there for a few months, but I know engagement's down. And so, I actually am going to survey my families and say, "Tell me what you need. What do we need to do differently?" Um, I. I think a lot of my uh, families have given us feedback that they're tired of the turnover, right? Um, yeah. And everyone's tired of the turnover. And um, we also need to look at tr the training and the retention of our behavior therapists because that's if without them, we're nothing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know what's so powerful about that, Kelly, is like how you, uh, your, your first instinct in solving this was like, let's ask families. Right. As opposed to sitting in an ivory tower somewhere and pontificating about why families might be canceling. And yep. like, so that I, that just feels really powerful. Like in any successful organization, ask your customer. Right. That's yeah. what you do in survey. I'm so I, I appreciate that. That's the approach you're taking to trying to solve family engagement. And you're exactly right. Family engagement is down. There's yep. a lot that goes into that. I, Kelly, who is your most important mentor and, and why were they so important to you? So I have a longtime mentor of mine. His name, I'll have to make sure he listens to this. His name is Dr. Joseph Donnelly. And um, mm -hmm. I originate from Boston. He originates from Boston. And he moved to California. I didn't know him in Boston. I didn't know him or his wife. His, his, um, they were in Boston. I was in Boston. And they moved to California. And he, we're in, we're in Southern, Orange County, Southern California, Orange County. He went to go work at UCI mm -hmm. in 2000, 2001. And he was mm -hmm. brought on to help get an organization going. It used to be called 4OC Kids Here. It was a diagnostic center through the school pediatrics in UCI. Dr. Mm -hmm. Pauline Philippek founded it. And um, he, he came on and started there. I approached him because I just moved to California and I said, you're from Boston. I'm from Boston. I want in on what you're doing. And he, it was pure diagnostics. They were all either developmental peds or, um, neuro psych, neuro psych, sorry. Uh, why is I'm blanking pediatric neurologist. He's a pediatric neurologist. Mm -hmm. And, um, so they would, they, they didn't have any place for an ABA person. So I used to go there for free and do parent classes and I just loved him. I loved how he interacted with the children. I loved his diagnostic style. He was an avid reader in the field of autism. And so right away in like 2002, like I said, I, I said, I want to be wherever you are. And I, for 10 years, he would refer people to my practice. I would go up to his organization mm -hmm. and he wanted to develop an autism center that was a one-stop shop through UCI. And he pulled together the financing in 2013, which had a lot to do with my part in closing, winding down my practice because I went to go work with him. And um, it was a center wow. that was an Autism Speaks ATN center. So we we're doing research out of there, diagnostics, um, clinical work. And 
Oddly, his interestingly, his wife worked in special education, and my husband and I actually met in 2005 because we sat on the board um, of a school here in California, and we opened, helped open, we were founding board members to open a school for middle school and high school kids. It's called New Vista School. It mm. rivals it rivals Portview Academy, which is the other amazing school, which Meloria and Edward run. And so we, we met because we were on that board. Melanie went to the school, my stepdaughter, and mm. Dr. Donnelly's wife ended up becoming the executive director of the school. And so, um, like the Donnellys are my people. Dr. Joseph Donnelly, this pediatrician, <laughs> his wife retired from running the school, and now my husband runs the school. <laughs> so he left the hedge fund business and decided he wanted to work for value for like something that filled up his cup. So he left hedge funds and he now runs the school. And so we're like the the Donnellys and the Birminghams were like this, <laughs> but I wouldn't be who I was without that, Dr. Yeah. Without Dr. Joseph Donnelly. You know, that shows to me, Kelly, is that there's, you know, having mentors, uh, I mean, certainly great supervisors, but also as mentors in your life and over the course of your life, that is not something you ever outgrow, right? It's not like, oh, I graduated my master's and then I had a great mentor for my 2000, 2200 hours and now I'm good. No, like, we should be constantly learning and seeking out great mentors. Um, that's cool. Hey, do you want to hear another funny, like <laughs> small world story from that? So Dr. Pauline Filipek, yeah. which I didn't even appreciate she was in California. Yeah. She moved to Houston. Yes. And when, yes, when I worked at Trumpet, um, we um, we would get referrals from her. And I mean, for evaluation reports dialed in, she locked yeah. in. And she, in fact, yeah. she's doing really cool stuff on diagnosing a little bit younger. Yep. But like so many families would come up and be like, um, we're afraid of Dr. Philip. <laughs> she, one of those, like, I, I get so smart and I just had this like aura about her. That is so funny that, uh, yeah. That, that, I got to work with Dr. Philip. She was, her mind is brilliant. Um, just brilliant. And she, she, she just has done amazing things in the field around diagnosing. Absolutely. You know, we just, I mean, our field needs more diagnosticians, period. But yeah. we need like, extraordinary diagnosticians like her and a Dr. Donnelly, like who are helping to mentor the next generation and build more capacity for that. And like, so, yeah, I mean, that's a whole separate podcast episode in and of itself. For sure. Well, I want to hear more about your podcast, um, you know, the, a 25 year look across the spectrum. Thanks. Thanks for mentioning it. So it's, it's a hobby. Um, I, you know, I'm certainly not getting, you know, it's a hobby, let me just say, but what it is, is, um, I do it with one of my best friends, Jen Lucero. I, full disclosure, Dr. Donnelly diagnosed her son, <laughs> referred her to me. And I used to work with her son when he was three and a half years old and I potty trained him. Um, and he is now 22 years old. <laughs> and I, she at one point worked for Autism Speaks. And so we found ourselves in a little bit of conflict of interest because I was at the center with Dr. Donnelly. We were an Autism Speaks a ATN site, which Autism Treatment Network site, and she was working for them. So mm -hmm. we stopped, I stopped working with her son, referred out. And so she and Dr. Donnelly and I all used to work together all the time on Autism Speaks projects in California. She now runs Special Olympics in Southern California. And we have just always worked together mm. in some capacity. So her son is 22. He's on the more severe, profound side on the autism spectrum. Um, I, we are best friends. I served him his, his conservatorship paperwork. I went with her to get his ID when he turned 18. Like we've, we're just kind of, you know, hand in hand. And when the pandemic started, we couldn't see each other. So we started zooming and then we'd be talking about topics. Mm -hmm. And I realized, wait a minute, we have this parent who's raised a child who has a parent perspective. I I'm a parent from one perspective and a BCBA. And what if we took topics and dissected it between the BCBA's perspective and the parent perspective? And it speaks to that caregiver collaboration oh, wow. model that I feel so strongly that like the parents need this equal voice. So we will talk, take a topic and we'll talk through it from those two perspectives. And we often have invite guests. I love that. Yeah. 
What's so? What's an example of a topic where there could be like different kinds of perspectives? Um, well, you know, they schooled me. She schooled me a little bit during the Great Resignation because she taught told me some things that I hadn't even thought of when everyone was sort of leaving and we were having staffing mm -hmm. issues. She said to me. Kelly, if you guys are just upfront with the parents and talk to them and tell them and um, ask them what they're looking for in a therapist that might be a better fit and, you know, and maybe don't bring in a therapist until they've all met and everyone agrees upon it, then that might, that would go a long way from the family's perspective. And shame on me that I never thought of that, right? I was at this high level, like crunching numbers and I need to hire this many people and fill these schedules. And she said to me, you know, are you asking the parents? Are you talking to them? And I'm like, no, of course I'm not, Jen. And so that was one where she schooled me. And I'm like, of course I should have been doing that. And, oh, that's and so powerful. How cool would it be if there was like a BCBA supervision program down the road where you got paired up with like a parent mentor who helped you understand? That's so cool. Yeah. That's a great idea. I never thought of it. Yeah. The, a couple of the things that we talked through that were eye opening to me, what there are two of my favorites actually. And one is where we talk and we have a couple other moms because we have a lot of moms raising boys with, on the autism spectrum and the whole puberty adolescence mm. masturbation topic comes up a lot mm. and we have, there's a very funny podcast that we did where we actually talk about like, you know, what are you going to do moms? <laughs> and there, we, we don't always have single moms. Sometimes there are dads in there, but how are we going to engage? Cause it's moms trying to teach boys, frankly, how to masturbate. And that doesn't work. And it's a lot of women BCBAs trying to talk to boy. And so that one was a funny one because just the insight that the moms gave me from their perspective was humorous, but it also, I think helped us all sort of realize you know, that we've got to, we've got to talk about this one. No one's talking about it. Exactly right. Exactly right. That's awesome. I, well, I can't wait to listen to more of those and definitely that masturbation episode and, <laughs> um, and, and what I could learn from that, about, uh, sharing that with my teams. So Kelly, what's one thing every ABA business owner should start doing and one thing they should stop doing? <laughs> That's a really good question. And I'm sure I don't do it all well. But I do think more asking of our therapists and, and family members what they want and need. Um, I know I've worked really hard on my retention plan these last six months and trying to make sure people are happy and what that means for them. And I think that um, that's changed during this pandemic. And you said it earlier, uh, words matter. I think... I've seen some great LinkedIn posts from people about this too. And it makes me so happy that other people think the way we think, you know, even changing language from billable hours, right? You know, we say to your team members, you know, did you meet your billable hours? That feels terrible. And it's just, it, it shows a lack of connect, like it shows a disconnect in our field. And I know I switched that language a couple of years ago and it's not billable hours. It's like service delivery. Right. You know, like, you know, are we servicing these families and children with all the hours that one they need two they deserve? And then three, do they even mm. want? Right. And so the words mm. we use, I think, pays, is has a lot to do with the discon some some disconnect between sort of some of the larger companies, some of the things we're seeing and the way people feel in their experience with those companies. So I just think, you know, asking the people and being so much more thoughtful about the types of words we use. You know, I, I was having a conversa conversation and someone said, well, the way to solve our scheduling cancellation problem is to over schedule, over schedule, just put the schedules on people, just put them on people's schedules and we'll get high cancellation rates, but you know, we might capture a few hours. And just the way that the words came out to me, I thought over schedule mm. that doesn't feel right. Right. Like what if, like I get the point, but mm. what if we're saying things like, Let's let's see what goals need to be done and, and accomplished, what skills we're teaching. And let's look at all the hours that child has where we could potentially work on those skills that might increase the amount of hours that they have or they need. And it, mm -hmm. it takes longer to do that. It's harder to do that. Um, you can't, you know, over schedule and get your numbers up as fast as you like. And so that's my perspective. 
again, you know, from a business standpoint, that feels hard. But I do feel like in the long term, our field will be served well if we just think about our words. As a leader, especially, like we might be talking to someone and whether or not we use a term like overscheduling, right, in, in an internal meeting, that might be an off right. the cuff thing. But That's right. Uh, but our teams are going to model or are going to script and use language that we use. And this is why as a leader, it just feels so important. We have that self-awareness and self-scrutiny of what's exactly. the language that we're using. And is that language in alignment with our values? And if it's not, let's pick some different language. Exactly. All right. Well, where can people find you online, Kelly? Mostly LinkedIn. I don't have um, LinkedIn. And then you can also find the Social Skill Learning Collaborative on Patreon. And then you can find our podcast on Apple or Spotify. Awesome. I'm, I'll link to all those in the show notes. Um, are you ready for the hot take questions? Rapid fire. Bring it on. <laughs> all right, Kelly. So you're on your deathbed. What's the one thing you want to be remembered for? I thought about this question. I want to be, I want to be remembered for my um, integrity, my honesty, and my compassion to specifically an understanding for kids and adults on the autism spectrum and their families. Mm, I love that. What's your most important self-care practice? I don't do it. I have not been doing it well enough lately, but um, for me, it is being out in nature in some capacity, whether it's being on the beach, hiking, going for a bike ride. Um, I'm trying to get better at it. Um, but for me, that's it. Nature. I'll take it. I just can't return from Montana with our family's annual fishing trip. We fly fish. And I did that. And I was like, oh, I need to remember to do more of this. <laughs> I was just in July in Montana. We took like a week and a half road trip through Canadian Rockies. And nice. I had no idea how beautiful, how beautiful it is. In fact, we did, I did a little fly fishing lesson with my three kids. Nice. Us, and there's something absolutely perfect. It's like truly like the movie River Runs Through It. Yes. Isn't there something perfect about fly fishing and getting into your flow state? And <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> We're going to do a separate episode, Kelly, on fly fishing and um, on Montana. So I can't <laughs> wait for that <laughs> We do uh, it what, every 4th of July. We go as a family and it's really fun. Ah, uh, so good. In Bozeman or where do you go? Um, actually, it's in the Brit Bitterroot Valley where they film Yellowstone now. Um, my my in-laws live in a little tiny town called Hamilton. No way. Awesome. Yep, and the Bitterroot right. River runs right through there and we, we fish there. It's oh, where I they filmed so a cool. river runs through it. It's where they filmed that. No way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, everything in Montana is beautiful, including all the streams and the trout. Uh, what's your favorite song, Kelly? So um, I'm going to date myself here. I am a huge Neil Diamond fan. I come from Boston. <laughs> I grew up listening to Neil Diamond. Um, any Neil Diamond song is a fan is a favorite of mine. Um, I saw Neil Diamond in Fenway Park and he played Sweet Caroline. Uh, five, he played it five times and it was never enough for our crowd. We over and over again. <laughs> wait, stop it. Five times Sweet Caroline in one concert. In one concert. He opened I, I, with it. He did it. You in doubled twice down. What worked? <laughs> <laughs> That's hysterical. Now, Sweet Caroline is also uh, a, a theme song for my favorite Boston Red Sox. We're not doing well this season, but uh, right. that is super cool. That is legend. <laughs> that's, that's bucket list stuff for me too. Yeah. Um, well, if you give your 18 year old self one piece of advice, what would it be? It would be to don't try so hard to be perfect. For mm. sure. To this day, I still, I want to be the best leader. I want to be the best everything. Um, and I've gotten much better at giving myself grace at making errors and, and being, and being okay if I didn't know how to do something and asking for help. I don't know. Well, if you could only wear one style of footwear, what would it be? Flip flops. <laughs> of I course, live in California chill, now. Southern California, OC, uh, clearly. But Kelly, this has been so much fun. Thank you for coming on the pod. Thanks, Jonathan. I appreciate it so much. You're doing great stuff out there. Keep it up. What up, listeners? Hey, I got something for you. 
If you like my Building Better Businesses in ABA podcast, you're going to love the Behavioral Observations podcast with Matt Sicoria. So I recently met Matt at ABAI, and let me tell you, I was just an instant fanboy. Matt's the real deal. His pod is all about stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. So session 191 on his pod is on the behavior analysis of lying. That's right, lying. How awesome is that? Who does that? He also talks social skills, act, FAs, and so much more. His guests include Greg Hanley, Jonathan Tarbox, and other legendary names in our field. And as a BCBA, you can even get CEU credits through behavioral observations. You can find Matt and the Behavioral Observations Podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast channel. Enjoy, friends. Thanks for listening to Building Better Businesses in ABA Podcast. Stay tuned for our next exciting episode. In the meantime, please like, subscribe, share, and comment. We value your feedback. Don't forget to follow us on social media at elementrcm.ai.